Hi, everyone, and welcome to this month's ERCC webinar. I'm Roger Alexander, the Scientific Coordinator for the Extracellular RNA Communication Consortium. And our speaker today is Guo Ping Li. He works with Soumya Das at the Cardiovascular Research Center of Mass General and Harvard Medical School. He's going to tell us about their work studying tRNA derived small RNAs, TDRs, and seeing if they're markers of stress. Please put questions in the chat throughout the talk, keep yourself muted. And then at the end, I'll ask the chat questions and then I'll open up the microphones for discussion. So, Guoping, go ahead. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Roger, for the kind introduction. So, I'm Guo Ping Li, instructor in Dr. Samir Das lab at Mass General and Harvard Med School. Today, I'm going to introduce your relatively new small RNA species called tRNA derived small RNAs, shortly TDRs. Uh, my talk will be three part. First, I'll give you some background of, uh, about the TDRs and uh, the optimized TDR sequencing technique called AMSIC. Then we'll talk about the differences between the cellular and extracellular TDRs and the stress-specific TDR signatures. The last part we'll discuss about the, briefly discuss about the biogenesis and stability regulation. This is an unknown area now. Uh, first, TDR are actually derived from the tRNAs. tRNA are well, well recognized as mRNA decoder for decades. There are about 500 tRNA genes in the human genome and above half of them are actively transcribed. That means when you count by the number of molecules, tRNA is the most abundant RNA species in the cells. Uh, about a decade ago, several independent groups has shown that uh, tRNA can be cleaved into uh, smaller fragments and under different stresses, including oxidative stress, nutrient deficiency. And more importantly, these fragments are proved to be functional. In the past decades, due to the advance of our sequencing technique, we have detected tons of TDRs and accumulating evidence has shown that these TDRs are actively involved in multiple uh, biological processes, including translation, RNAi, stress granule formation, and apoptosis. But I would still say that the TDR we identified is still only a small part of it because tRNA identification of the TDR is technically challenging because there's a lot of base modifications present on the TDRs or tRNAs. So that means with the conventional small RNA seq, these modifications, especially the methylation, including M1A, M1G, and M3C, they were induce reverse transcription termination during the cDNA prep. You will not get the full information about the TDR you are detecting. Uh, recently, uh, Dr. Louis from UCSC developed this optimized uh, TDR sequencing technique called AMSIC, which leveraged the pretreatment of APKB to remove some of these methylations, including M1A and 3C. It will facilitate the reverse transcription. We'll get more uh, robust information about the TDRs. And most recently, there's a advanced technique called DMTRNA-seq, which has a mutation of the RKB combined both to remove the M1G as well. But what we have now is AMSIC in our lab. After equipped with this AMSIC workflow in our lab, we are interested in, uh, in ischemia heart disease. As you may know, ischemia heart disease remains at the world's leading cause of death, which leads to 9 million deaths in the world every year. Ischemia happens when the coronary artery is blocked by a plaque. And even though we can put a stand there to reopen the artery, but during the reopening, they still have a reperfusion injury. So we are wondering how the TDR regulated during the cardiac ischemia reperfusion injury process. So we are using now in vitro stress response platforms. We have four different cell types, including the primary cardiomyocyte, cardiofibroblast from neonatal rats. And to get an idea about the general stress response in other cell types, we also include the hex cells and a BWO cell, which is a cancer cell line. And we challenge them with three different ischemia reperfusion related stressors, including nutrition deprivation, hypoxia, oxidative stress. To clarify the methods, we used the serum are EV depleted and the cellular RNA were isolated by trisor. Extracellular RNA was isolated by XRNA-EZ kit. 
We validated our in vitro stress response platform by qPCR and Western blot. I will not go deeper, but here I will expand you the Western blot data. The GST means glucose and certain deprivation, which refers to the nutrition deprivation here. And it usually well known is induced autophagy. So you can see here it's actually have more cleaved LC3B. Hypoxia usually stabilize HIF1 alpha protein and induce expression of DIP4. H2O2, which is oxidative stress, will induce a lot of DNA double strand break, which will be characterized by the phosphorylation of H2AX. So we have other qPCR data showing these stresses have a, a appropriate stress response in these cell types. Before doing the sequencing, because we have 24 groups, three tripli uh, triplicates for each group, totally 96 samples, we want to know, confirm that our ARMSIC indeed works in our lab. So we use the HEX to do both the conventional small RNA seq and ARM seq. So the, this untreated are conventional small RNA seq. Treated with AFKB means they are ARM seq. So as you can see here, we even uh, with the AFKB treated group, we can get two times more TDR reads compared to the conventional small RNA seq. When we check the coverage plot, this plot show uh, this uh, line show here is the well known M1A uh, modification and the position 58. So you can see with the conventional small RNA seq, usually you cannot cross this line because these methylation will induce the reverse transcription termination. But with arm seq, we can detect easily cross that line and get more abundant information about the five prime TDRs. These are a few examples I want to point out here. This is the prime TDR derived from tRNA ASPGTC. This is this five prime TDR is specifically induced by hypoxia in hex cells. But if you are using conventional small RNA seq, you are not able to detect this TDR even. So I would say with ARM seq, we can get more abundant and diverse information about the TDRs. Then we went ahead and do the bug sequencing of these samples. We have totally uh, 24 groups, uh, 96 samples. The, the, the primary analysis about these TDR reads get, for each samples, we can get from 5% to even 50% of the TDREs in the whole a small RNA population. This 5% even less because this is the, I will talk about later, this is H202 treated hexal extracellular RNA samples because you induce a lot of RNA1 that degrades a lot of the TDRs. Interestingly, in the cardiomyocyte, side, this has 40% of the small RNAs are TDRs. Also in the extracellular RNA derived from cardiomyocyte side and cardiofibroblast. So indicating every cell has their different preference about expressing the TDR or generate the TDR in response to some stress response. So we did some basic characterization of these TDRs, including cellular and extracellular. The blue plot here shows you the cellular TDRs is ranging from 16 nucleotides to 62 nucleotides have a wide range, which is consistent to the previous finding. But when you check the extracellular TDR, it is very specifically at 31 to 33 nucleotides. So we, want, we also confirm this phenotype in other stressors in other cell types, even in the cardiomyocyte, this is other species. It has the same phenotype. So all of the extracellular TDR are mainly 31 to 33 nucleotides, and the extra, uh, intracellular TDR has a wide range from 16 to 62. 31 to 33 nucleotides TDRs appears to be tRNA halves. So we went ahead and do the coverage plot. So this is the five prime end of the tRNA, the three prime end of the uh, tRNA, this anticodon loop. As you can see here, the Intracellular TDR has a wide range, but mainly from three prime to the end of the tRNA genes. But extracellular TDR are mainly either co either coming from the five prime end or the three prime end. Like seventy percent of them coming from the five prime end, and 30, 25 percent of them coming derived from the three prime end of the tRNA genes. And this is conserved, preserving other stressors in other cell types and cons conserving other species. Interesting, we also noticed that extracellular three prime TDR has a different termination position compared to the three prime, the intracellular three prime TDRs. So we further run these termination position analysis. Consistently, the extracellular TDR, five prime TDR ends at the anticodon loop ranging from position 31 to 33. 
And, but the extracellular five, three prime TDR ends at position 74, which is a C because every tRNA genes has a CCA tail. The intracellular TDR usually ends at position 76. This is the end of these tRNA genes. And this is preserved and conserved in other stressors in the other cell types and species. In addition to those basic characterizations, we also were still in processing this analysis because the modification. This is a very interesting pheno uh, a phenomenon in when you're sequencing the tRNA or TDRs. Because as these main methylations were usually induce reverse transcription termination, but some other modifications usually can induce the reverse transcription pause. And occasionally the reverse transcriptase can cross that position by incorporating a random nucleotide. This is called misincorporation. We also call it the mismatch. So by calculating the mismatch rate, we can predict the modification level of that specific position in the specific TDR. Those, here, I'm just going to show you an example. This is the three prime TDR derived from tRNA-SP. Because we already used ARMSeq, we removed the majority of the methylation that induced the reverse trans transcription termination. So we didn't see a much mismatch. But when we check the extracellular version of the same TDR derived from the same position, but has four nucleotides longer than the intracellular version, you can see there has a, a much more abundant mismatch rate in the position, especially this position 69. So that means this position has some modifications that induce the reverse transcription pause in this, in this position and also indicate that extracellular TDR may need some specific modification than the uh, from the intracellular TDR to be secreted out or to be processed. We have some, some preliminary data showing that actually these two cellular TDR and extracellular TDR derived from the same position, same tRNA genes actually have different functions inside the same cells. So probably I'm going to present this one in the year, upcoming ERCC investigator meeting this month. So we want to run the further, go to the differential expression analysis. Before doing that, we want to figure out a system that can name in each TDR because TDR has or derive, maybe all derived from the same tRNA gene, you cannot name them as, a, as the normal way, usual way we name the genes, because they are derived from, they have different length, they have different cleavage sites. So there are some conventional naming system. We usually name the 31 to 30, above 31 tRNA halves, less than that tRNA fragments, but that's too general. We cannot identify each, each TDRs. Recently, there is some suggestions. This is where the meat map, they can usually, the basic principle is give every TDR identified a plate number, like your car, car plates. But this, I would say, because with the advances of the sequencing technique, we would identify more and more TDRs. We cannot give all of them each a unique number. So this is the naming system. Sorry proposed by Doc Louis. It's very general, straightforward. And you can identify information about these TDR specifically, where they're coming from, how long it is, and whether they have mutation or not. This is called TDR namer. The first part of the TDR, of course. Then the second was the position from the original TNA genes. Let's say this one is derived from the position four to position 33. And this is the genes, the TNA genes, the aaa dash one genes. M7 means it has multiple mapping to seven different genes. U10A means that uh, position 10 has a mutation from uridine to A. So we are identifying each specific TDR with a different se uh, sequences as a unique genes or unique TDR and then run the DC. Uh, to compare, I will show you the uh, microRNA first. Each dot each dot here means your micro specific microRNA. The line ligates the same microRNA together across different samples. Uh, this is the cellular sample, these are the extracellular samples. As you can see, there's about 200 microRNA identified in these groups. And in the extracellular one, there's only few of them has abundant enrichment. Uh, most of them doesn't change or doesn't express too much in the extracellular samples. 
But when you see the extracellular TDR, uh, the TDRs, it has a very abundant expression about we can detect 2000 or even more TDRs expressed in these samples, even in the extracellular samples. Even though that the inside the cell, the TDR doesn't change that dramatically, but when you check the extracellular samples, a lot of them, are actually induced by the stress or depleted by the stress, indicating that the extracellular TDRs are more dynamically regulated by the stress, especially outside. So we also validate the TDRs we detected by using ARMSIG. We have the hack cells first. Is the validation works very well? We almost we almost validate most of the top genes either in the cells or in the extracellular samples across different sam stressors. Then further, we want to know whether the extracellular TDR signatures can be used to distinguish different stressors. Here is the basic PCA plot showing uh, using either TDR signatures or microRNA signatures. The triangle here shows the extracellular samples. Different color means the different stressors. As you can see here, the TDR signatures can easily separate those stressors inside the hex cells, inside the cardiomyocyte. But when you are using microRNA signatures, they are overlapped, so they fail to separate those. Even though they can uh, well separate the intracellular samples using microRNA signatures. And this phenotype will also seen by using other algorithms, including UMAP, TSNI, and Spearman correlation. So this is the stress-dependent uh, cellular and extracellular TDR signatures we got. I will not go deeper, but uh, an idea you can uh, take home is extracellular TDR indeed have a much more abundant and diverse dynamic uh, regulation because Almost we can detect 1,000 or 2,000 extracellular uh, TDRs under different stressors, but in the intracellular, in the cellular one only have few. By combining the human and rat different stressors, we mainly focus on the extracellular TDR. We identify 1,000 nutritional deprivation induced extracellular TDRs, like 600 oxidative stress induced extracellular TDRs, and about 160 hypoxia-induced extracellular TDRs in the human cells. And in the rat cells, we can even more. And this is the top 10 to 20 differentially expressed genes across different stressors. Uh, not go deeper, but here you can see this is the TDR derived from the position one to position 36 of uh, tRNA HBGTC. This is specifically induced by nutritional deprivation in both human cells. And also in the rat cells, this is the different Although they have different names, but they have the same sequence. Okay, the naming system has a lot of differences between the human species and the rat. So we want to validate whether these in vitro system built derive these t extracellular TDR signatures under different stressors can be used to predict the stress response in the human body. We choose the human patient that undergoing cardio surgery that has to be uh, had to be connected to the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. So the blood will be taken out, oxygenated, and transfused back. We collect the plasma before connecting to the bypass machine, and one about an hour after connecting to the bypass machine. Because before doing that, we have been demonstrated that if you're using conventional small RNA seq, you can rarely detect the tRNA genes in the plasma samples. This is two reports showing that you can detect less than 5% of the tRNA genes in the human plasma. But with our arm seq, luckily we can get about 10% of the small RNA reads aligned to the tRNA genes, it means we can detect more of the TDR reads using arm seq. So we did the basic characterization of these plasma TDRs as well. We found consistently to our, consistent to our in vitro stress platforms, we found that plasma TDR, mainly extracellular TDRs, 31 to 35 nucleotides derived from either five prime TN, five prime end of the TNA genes or three prime end of the TNA genes. And the termination position either at 31 to 33 position, it's anticodinal loop or uh, 74 position of the TNA genes. 
We also noticed these small part 16 to 18 nucleotides that derive from the three prime end of the tRNA genes. We don't know why, because maybe it derived from other cell types we didn't provide this time. So we went further to, to run the PCA plot to show whether these plasma TDR signature can be used to separate different stresses like the before connecting, uh, one hour after connecting to the bypass machine. So luckily we can see the TDR signature works even much better than the microRNA to separate the pre-CPP uh, group from the post-CPP group. With the AMSIC, we identified around 130 differentially expressed TDRs and we overlap these with stress specific TDR signatures in our in vitro cell culture system. Uh, interestingly, we found these bypass connecting CBP regulated TDRs overlapped with either nutrition deprivation extracellular TDRs or oxidative stress induced extracellular TDR signatures, but not overlap with the hypoxia induced extracellular TDR signatures. So that means it may has the nutrition de deficiency response or the oxidative stress response, but not hypoxia response. Because it is also reasonable to us because the blood will be oxygenated and transfused back. This is a few examples. I will point out this one. This is the three prime TDRs and at position 74, of course, from arginine TCT. This specific TDR can only be detected an hour after connecting to the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. So a summary here that our ARM-seq works better than the conventional small RNA-seq on detecting TDRs and the extracellular TDR has a very unique fragmentation pattern. It is 31 to 33 nucleotides in length and it's mainly tRNA halves, mainly a five prime and terminate at either anticodon loop uh, or position 74. And extracellular TDR are dynamically regulated by the stresses than the intracellular one, and it provides better discrimination between different stress response compared to microRNAs. And these stress specific TDR signatures can be used to predict the stress response in the human body. So the last part, we'll talk a little about the biogenesis. Uh, this, in the past 10 years, we have identified tons of TDR, even though with the more advanced techno technique, we can detect more. But about the biogenesis, we, the knowledge about the biogenesis is still limited. We only know that as few ribonucleases is responsible for their biogenesis, including angiogenin, Dicer, and RNAs1, ELAG, RNAz, actually. And also about the Extracellular TDR biogenesis, this remains unknown, I think. Only a few studies propose that extracellular TDR are generated outside by uh, RNAs1, a few of them. So we can, in this case, we want to know that the well-known ribonuclease, whether they are re uh, regulated or whether they are involved in the biogenesis uh, of TDR during the stress response. First of all, we detect the well-known four ribonuclease during the stress response. As you can see here, the hypoxia induced the most abundant expression of angiogenin and RNAs1 is most significantly induced by H2O2. So we went ahead and do, uh, knock out those uh, two uh, uh, ribonuclease respectively and expose them to the stress uh, accordingly. Like angiogenin goes to hypoxia treatment and RNAs1 knockout goes to H2O2 treatment. So this is the sequencing we get using AMSIC, of course, we have the cellular RNAs and extracellular RNAs. We were expected that when we knock out the rival nucleus, because they are responsible for their biogenesis, suppose we should detect less of the tRNA reads. Unexpectedly, we found that in the cell, it doesn't change too much, but on the side of the cells, it induced a knockout of these angiogenin or RNAs1 uh, dramatically increase the reads of tRNA re uh, TDRs, as you can see here. This is the extracellular tRNA read. When you knock out either antigen or RNAs1 at the baseline, it has like double or even triple the, re the reads. And even at a hypoxia condition, it increases. In the h 2 true treatment, as I showed before, this very less little amount of TDR reads we can detect in after treated with the hex cells with h 2 but when you knock out RNAs1, it almost re recovered to the 10% 10, 10%. So 
that also indicates that these ribonuclease, including angiogenin and RNAs1, not only responds for the biogenesis, but also responds for the degradation, or we can say stability regulation. So we further want to know, can we have dual roles in the TDR biogenesis and stability regulation? So here we, this is a little complicated. So we separate the upregulation and downregulation to, to explore the angiogenic induced or angiogenic depleted TDRs. So if a TDR, let's say here, if a TDR goes up in the white type cells, but doesn't goes up in the, after angiogenic knockout, we claim this one as angiogenic induced TDRs. In the opposite way, if these TDRs are downregulated upon hypoxia in the white type cells, but does not go down in the angiogenic knockout cells, which means these are angiogenic depleted TDRs. So here in the extracellular TDR, in angiogenic induced TDRs, uh, we found the majority of them are mature TNA derived. Interestingly, the angiogenic depleted T, uh, uh, TDRs, in cellular TDRs, are mainly derived from the pre TNA or pre TNA precursors. And the, this is the coverage plot of angiogenic induced cellular TDRs. It is TNA hubs. It doesn't behave, it looks like the previous intracellular TDRs with mainly derived from three prime TNA rather than. It, had, it is mainly TNA hubs. This is consistent to the previous finding. <clears throat> the angiogenes induce a coverage and at the anti codon loop and generate the TNA hubs. So we did the same thing in the extracellular samples. We identified about 500 angiogenic induced extracellular TDRs and 500 angiogenic depleted extracellular TDRs. They are mainly coming from the, derived from the mature TNAs. And it, the coverage plot shows a very interesting finding because the angiogenic depleted uh, TDRs, this is the red plot, it has like one nucleotide longer than the angiogenic induced TDRs, same here. So we went ahead and do the length distribution and position. Consistently, you see the angiogenic depleted TDRs are 33 nucleotide in length, but the angiogenic induced TDR are 31 to 32 uh, nucleotide in length. In the, the end position also showed it trim, it has one uh, nucleotide differences. When we go further to each individual TDR, we found a lot of these case happens. So this is the TDR derived from the glue CTC is from position one to position 33. This specific TDR is downregulated upon hypoxia treatment, but, but this same TDR, but has one nucleotide shorter is upregulated in the upon hypoxia treatment. When we knock out the angiogenin, this downregulation and upregulation doesn't happen. Means it's indicated that maybe the angiogenin is trimming the longer 33 nucleotide TDR, trimming just one nucleotide from this one to 32 nucleotide TDRs. So we have the same similar finding in other cell type. This is just an example here showing indicating the angiogenin is trimming some extracellular TDR during a uh, hypoxia response. So this the data from the RNAs1 knockout is different than the angiogenin because RNAs1, we rarely can detect the RNAs1 induced TDRs. From the cells, we can only identify 15 and for the extracellular, there's no. But we have identified a large number of RNAs1 depleted cellular TDRs, like in about 900 RNAs1 depleted TDRs, about half of them derived from mature TNA and half are derived from the premature TNA. We have a similar range with our intracellular TDRs, means the RNAs1 processing or uh, running the quality control of most the main population of the cellular TDRs. In the extracellular RNA samples, we identify around 1,000 300 extracellular TDR that are depleted by RNAs1 during the JO2 treatment and ma mainly coming from the mature TNAs. This is the coverage plot. It's very consistent with uh, TNA halves, most of them coming from the 5 prime end and 20% of coming from 3 prime end. Another question here is also remaining in the extracellular TDRs, we still don't know it localized. 
some suggest the earlier, the very earlier suggestion saying these extracellular PDRs are localized in the non-vascular RNPs. But latest some uh, reports showing that the extracellular TDRs are present in the extracellular vesicles and is respond is required for the homostasis of T cells or other cell types. It can be transferred to other cells through their EVs. So here we are still in processing to uh, to sequence the EV fraction or non-EV fractions by using a more advanced technique called AutoSeq. But in this case, we are focused on a very famous extracellular ribonuclease protein called ARGO2. ARGO2 is well known by its ability to export or protect the microRNAs in the extracellular space from either a ribonuclease degradation. So we want to know whether ARGO2 did the same thing to TDRs. So we knock out using CRISPR and we just collect extracellular RNA samples from these knockout cell lines, compare us to the white type. We usually we identify around 854 extracellular TDRs are downregulated upon uh, ARGO2 knockout and mainly coming from the glue, TNA glue. When checking the basic characters of these ARGO2 dependent extracellular TDRs, we found it's about ranging from 27 to 35. And the coverage plot doesn't show a perfect TNA halves. Also, the end position is differs from 28, 36, 70 to 75. So when you if you can recall the main population of the extracellular TDRs has a very unique peak at 31 to 33 nucleotides. So that means the ARGO2 is only necessary for transporting or stabilizing a subset population of extracellular TDRs. Here is a, an example showing the ARGO2 dependent extracellular TDRs. So to summary here, that angiogenin and RNAs1 are not only involved in the biogenesis, but also in, uh, involved in the stability regulation of either of both the cellular and extracellular TDRs during stress response. And ARGO2 is only necessary for transporting or stabilizing a subset of the extracellular TDR populations. If you want to uh, have more information about especially the TDR signatures, I don't spend a long time explaining those. You can go to our published paper. I want to acknowledge the whole DAS lab and the collaborators from MGH, UCSC, Brigham, MMI, UCSD, and TGEN. And also thank you for the funding from HA and NIH. I'm happy to take any question. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Guoping. We have a question from Janusz Rock in the chat who asks, do TDRs generated by angiogenin have a role in angiogenesis? I think so, because there are some reports saying angiogenin generated TDRs are involved in the angiogenesis of uh, HUVAC cells. There's a publication on that. But angiogenin not only involved in the angiogenesis, because we have some data showing the angiogenin depends on TDRs have some other roles, not in angiogenesis. So you mentioned the vesicular versus non-vesicular localization, and then you're starting to work on it for the argonaut-associated TDRs. Yep. Just to dig into that a little more, if I recollect, Tosa and et al. found the non-vesicular tRNAs that are extracellular are enriched for things that get degraded, and the ones that survive are dimers of mostly glycine and glutamic acid. But it seemed as if it seemed as if in your data that, that those two aren't enriched, and you're finding other tRNA uh, fragments of other tRNAs, and so that maybe that's not the mechanism, or but that could be part of it. I think it all depends on the motif. Let's say the motif of the TDRs. If the motif, I think that a dimer forms with the uh, G or some specific motif, they can form a dimer that protect them from the degradation of other ribonuclease. But uh, I would say probably we have some data showing that some extracellular TDR are protected in the EVs. Also here, the ARGO2 also protects like 800 different TDRs. So it all depends on their motif. And also I think the extracellular TDR shows you that they have a different fragmentation profile have different end position and different modification. They may require for their binding for their uh, exporting. So the maybe the key to survive in the extracellular space full of a ribonuclease. 
So you mentioned that it was surprising that under stress, when RNases were upregulated, that the amount of extracellular TDRs increased. My, tell me if you think this hypothesis makes sense that normally under stress, those RNases would degrade tRNAs that have been fragmented or otherwise misfolded or whatever. And then when you knock out those RNases, there's an increase in fragments that the cell doesn't want. And so they get either randomly because there's so many of them or specifically exported. Does that make sense? I think so. We cannot say the cell doesn't, that's the, also a controversial place that we, but here I can tell you that the RNAs one, usually these ribonuclease not only produced inside the cells, they can also be secreted outside. So when we knock out them and we collect, we collect the extracellular RNAs, we can detect a, a very high level of TDRs when you compare to the white type cells. That means the RNAs one, especially the RNAs one, is responsible for the, the degradation of these TDR, extracellular TDR in response to oxidative stress, which also induced the, RNA, uh, the RNAs one expression inside the cells. But I think it's here. So you can see here, the let's say the angiogenin is increased by hypoxia. So interestingly, you can see the angiogenin depleted TDR are mainly derived from the pre tRNAs. It's not from the mature tRNA. So I can say, I would like to say that they have, uh, they are specific quality control of these, TD, of these TDRs to maintain their level and to maintain the hemostasis of the cell or try to maintain the, the appropriate stress response to the stresses. Another couple of questions from Yanush. Are EV associated TDRs detectable in hypoxic cancers, e.g. post-antiangiogenic therapy or in brain tumors? Are these EV TDRs detectable in plasma or biofluids? We are using the exoRNA easy. It doesn't it not only capture the EV fraction, but also the other ribonuclear protein fraction. As we know, it has some contamination of other uh, fragment, but we have isolated the EVs and run a northern blot. We have some data showing that these actors, uh, these EVs containing a decent amount of TDRs as well. Uh, but for the AMSIC, we can detect few of them, but not all of them, because uh, I think to Dr. Tosa has shown that EVs has a large number of full length TNAs, and it can be cleaved inside the vesicles by angiogenin to generate the TDRs. With our ARMSEQ, we cannot detect the whole length, but we indeed detect a population of TDR inside the vesicles. So I would say in the tumor patients, we haven't done yet, we haven't done that yet, but I'm pretty confident that we can detect the EV associated TDRs in hypoxia cancers. But I think I I think it's here. In our BWO cells, actually the cancer cell that has a resistance to to hypoxia. So you can see here, we only have one, 170 extracellular TDR that are regulated by hypoxia in tumor cells, compared to 1,500 TDR regulating the normal cell types. I'm not expecting a lot of differentially expressed EV associated TDRs in, in the tumor cells upon hypoxia. Other than the, the length of the reads that you're getting from ARMSeq, if you start to fractionate and look for vesicular versus non-vesicular fractions, is there anything technical about that upstream fractionation process that would make arm stream difficult on those different fractions? We are trying to understand the biogenesis either outside or localization inside of the vesicles or outside of vesicles. But now due to the sequencing technical limitation, the arm seed can only detect a I would say only can detect a small population of TDRs. We, we have recently developed an advanced sequencing technique called OTASIC in Dr. Louis lab. We are still uh, optimizing it to capture uh, the whole land TNA genes and also the TDRs more. With that technique, we, I think we probably can answer that question later. Uh, later. Another question in chat from Zenyu Chen who asks, do EVs contain more than TDRs and how might TDRs trigger a target cell response? That's what we're working now. The, we are just characterize all of the EVs. I mean, there are regulations. The next step is doing the functional study. We have some preliminary data showing that EV actually in cardiomyocyte and cardiofibroblast, that EV is secreting these TDRs indispensable for their homostasis. If you block this process, 
either you knock out, you inhibit the TDI, extracellular TDI itself, or block the secretion of using the well-known inhibitor, it will induce the cell death of uh, both uh, cardiomyocyte and cardiac fibroblasts. And also we can detect a distant accumulation of the TDRs if you block the EV secretion. Yeah, we are still working on that. So probably we can have the answer soon. Maybe I'm showing my bias towards extracellular, but to me, an extracellular tRNA fragment, it qualitatively makes sense because it's either been selected to be secreted or randomly put in a vesicle. I guess what I'm asking is cellular TDRs, either there's a thousand different ways they can be uh-huh. created. What, yeah. Is this new nomenclature, am I, does my question make sense? I don't know. Where, so where I, the I guess the question... From? I guess probably our question is about whether these TDR are generated inside the cells and secrete out, or is generated outside the cells. Yeah, you made the point about RNA one that if it's exported, th- that it could be digesting things extracellularly yeah. and, de- and depleting so it. Yeah. I don't think it has a uniform mechanism for their secretion. You cannot say it's all of them are all of the extracellular TDR are generated inside the cells are specifically secreted out. I would say still it is hard. Uh, like some population are generated outside of cells because we have detect the whole and tRNA outside of extracellular space. So they can be cleaved to smaller TDRs. But also we have detect some EV associated TDRs. So when we block the secretion of EVs, we see the accumulation of these extracellular TDR inside the cells. So I would say it's not a one mechanism fits all. It has different mechanisms for their secretion and mechanism for their biogenesis as well. Do you have a hypothesis about the molecular mechanism or the reason of that difference in the 74 versus 76 length at the three prime end? You know, what's digesting those two nucleotides and why? That's we, I don't think it's the, the RNA, the no, ribonuclease. We are still trying to screen that RNAs that response for the generation inside the cells. Because when we knock out the ang- uh, angiogenin or RNAs1, we didn't see the shifting of the position 74 in the acrocellular RNAs. So that means these two nuclear and uh, ribonuclease we knock out is not responsible for that coverage, at least. This area, especially the biogenesis in the acrocellular TDI is largely unknown. I think we need uh, like a CRISPR screening of all the ribonuclease to try to answer that question. This is a good question. I think it's also really give us the answer why these extracellular TDR are specifically embedded or secreted outside or protected by, especially secretion. It's other than that end position, like position 74, for or most of the extracellular TDRs, the modification also play some roles in that secretion as well. As you can see in that slides, we have shown that we have different modification profile. And you showed, I think it was in the angiotensin and RNAs1 depletion cases, the difference in the five prime halves of one nucleotide in length. Yeah. But then in another slide you showed there were some, I think in plasma that were 35 nucleotides in length. And I, I wonder if you think those are related or some other mechanism. The 31, the angiogenin deplete, our hypothesis is, is when we check the individual TDRs one by one, we found something like this is trimming from 33 to 32, mainly here, like angiogenin depleted TDRs are 33 nucleotides in length, but angiogenin induced TDR 31 to 32 nucleotides. Well, our hypothesis is the angiogenin is is trimming this one during the hypoxia stress response. But in the plasma, the plasma is 31 to 35. 31, 32, that could be a problem. Yeah, I think you are right. This is a little bit less consistent to the antigenin induced TDRs. This is the human plasma, it's super complicated. I yeah. And also, this is the 16 to 18 nucleotides we haven't detected them in our cell culture system yet. I think it may derive from some specific cell types or processed by the circulating ribonuclease. So yeah, probably that could be an answer for this specific peak because you will see it's also lose their 33 nucleotides peak, but rather than replace with 31 to 35.
It has a longer one, 35. We don't know the answer yet. Does angiogenin naturally digest three prime to five prime? My, my thought was if it's, if it's depleted, then it would start to digest, but then stop. But you would expect to see multi, you, you would see one shorter, two shorter, three shorter, and you're only seeing the one shorter. So yeah, we only see the one shorter. I'm not sure how we expose the cells to 30 to 24 hours. And we only see these one nucleotide short, or two, one or two nucleotide shorter. We didn't see a much shorter TDRs from the same TNA genes. So it's kind of interestingly specific. Uh, Janusz asks another question, what are the properties of the proteome in EVs that contain TDRs? I'm assuming they're sensitive to GW4869, which I have no idea what that is, e.g. asmase dependent, but have they been purified and characterized? And Samia answers, <laughs> most TVs <laughs> contain TDRs, although a large proportion of TDRs are in the RNP fraction as well. I don't think anyone has shown TDR specific EVs. By the way, if you guys want to ask your questions by voice, please feel free. We're in the end discussion time. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to monopolize it. But my question, one question I have, is there something about TDRs specifically as one species of small RNA that you thought would have a role in stress or are you just surveying and found them to have a role? No, we have shown that the TDRs behavior distinctly from the small RNA like microRNA that had the similar size. It does not, and maybe it's regulated like several reports showing that it may bind to the three prime UTL mRNA inhibiting their translation, regulating their stability. But in our case, what we found that the behavior very different from the, from my, microRNAs. What we have shown here in our system, we have three different systems showing that a specific TDRs in the hex cells, I think it's that one, it can induce the the RNA autophagy by sequestering the PUS genes regulating the RNA pseudourination. This is the one study. The second one is we found that the actress one specific TDR are induced by nutritional deprivation in cardiac fibroblast. We found that one can specifically localize in lysosomes and inhibit the fibrotic fibrosis. And the extracellular TDR, as I mentioned before, that secretion of and that extracellular TDR is required for maintaining the homostasis of both cardiomyocytes and cardiofibroblasts. For the intracellular one, they have very distinct function. We are just provide all of them. We are we will go them one by one to study their function or to screen them at least. For the extracellular TDR, I think the secretion is required for the homostasis part of it. And some secretion may be targeting the recipient cells to behave on their other functions, other cell types. I always say this, but my last question is, you mentioned the possibility of a CRISPR screen of RNAs. What's, what's the order of magnitude of, R, of the number of RNAs in the human genome? Is that project like Broad Institute scale or like, is that a feasible project? It is, it's only, I think there's only 30 I checked I proposed in my proposal last time, but something I deleted. <laughs> it's about 30 to 40 ribonuclease in the human genome. So you can easily, let's say, let's just only design four guide RNAs targeting each. So totally it's about 120 guide RNAs targeting the whole ribonuclease. So it will be very feasible to do that, to screen it. And then using, combine our technique like ARMSeq, and also we have the DMT RNA seq also, the most about, uh, recent OTA-seq, we can easily answer that by genesis about these TDRs, including cellular and extracellular TDRs. Yeah, that would be a very interesting data set, the whole mysterious under, yeah, understudied yeah. area. Are there any other questions from anyone for Guoping? If not, I want to thank you very much. This is really interesting work, and there's a lot left to do. Yeah. Uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Very happy to share the TDRs. I think a lot of things, including the biogenic function, is very fascinating. I like it. Yeah. Thanks, right, everybody. Thank you.